So, you have a tent and a rig, and you love overlanding. You have plans to do it big, on the trails and some super glamping? Want ideas, tips, news, and reviews? A podcast that's first rate and here just for you? You don't have to think about it. Join us and be about it. Something interesting? We want to hear about it. Come on, let's talk about it. Welcome to Waypoint Overland's Random Waypoints Podcast. Sponsored by Midland. Communication for every adventure. The industry leader in radio communication technology and innovation for over 50 years. Sponsored by MyMedic. Sponsored by Tembo Tusk. Sponsored by Trail Rated Coffee Company. Always remember, the opinion you follow should be your own. Just consider the things stated here to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Hi, my name is Phil from Waypoint Overland, and you're listening to Random Waypoints. All right, so here we go. Welcome to another episode of the Random Waypoints podcast. We'll be doing an episode every week, so like, share, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell to make sure you don't miss an episode. This week on Waypoints, I demonstrate how to operate special functions of a Garmin satellite communicator. And on random lists, I give my top festivals and state fairs you should add to your overland plans. So stay tuned for the whole show. But first, let's take a look at the news. During this segment, we'll cover various topics with a connection to overlanding in some way. It could be land use news regarding the national parks or the Bureau of Land Management. We'll keep you up to date on any auto industry news when it pertains to relevant and potential overlanding vehicles. There will be camping and outdoor industry news, as well as photography and video, fishing, hiking, and on and on. Now, here's the news. The all-new 2022 Jeep Grand Cherokee 4XE, the first ever electrified Grand Cherokee, dominated the field at the 27th annual Mudfest competition hosted by the Northwest Automotive Press Association. The Jeep brand won three of the eight vehicle categories, with the all-new 2022 Jeep Grand Cherokee 4XE taking home top honors, being voted Northwest Outdoor Activity Vehicle of the Year. Members of the Northwest Automotive Press Association spent two days testing vehicles on paved and off-road routes. Testing took place at the Ridge Motorsport Park in Shelton, Washington. Journalists tested 20 vehicles from 17 manufacturers to select winners in eight categories, subcompact and compact, family, mid- and full-size family, compact and mid-size luxury, full-size luxury, pickup trucks, extreme capability, electrified utility vehicle, and outdoor activity vehicle of the year. The overall winner, the all-new 2022 Jeep Grand Cherokee 4XE, was selected from the category winners to be named the 2022 Northwest Outdoor Activity Vehicle of the Year. The all-new 2022 Grand Cherokee 4XE is the first Grand Cherokee to offer a plug-in hybrid variant. Its introduction signals the continued growth of the Jeep brand's electrified mission of zero-emission freedom as the brand explores future mobility. The 2022 Grand Cherokee 4XE offers 25 miles of all-electric range and 56 miles per gallon electric from a PHEV system that delivers 375 horsepower and 470 foot-pounds of torque, 0 to 60 miles per hour in 6 seconds, and a maximum towing of 6,000 pounds. The Grand Cherokee 4XE comes standard with a two-speed transfer case, a 27211 lower range ratio, and a 4741 crawl ratio. When equipped with the quadrilift air suspension, the Grand Cherokee 4XE delivers up to 10.9 inches of ground clearance and 24 inches of water fording capability. Cadillac engineers recently completed the 80% validation drive for the 2023 Cadillac Lyric, a critical milestone in Cadillac's full luxury EV's development, marking a transition to the final stage prior to production. By confirming that all components and technologies are at, at or beyond 80%, Engineers can now focus on fine-tuning Lyric prior to production. To facilitate a comprehensive 
evaluation of lyrics' performance on different road surfaces and in varying traffic conditions, Cadillac developed a curated route that included freeway, urban, and rural driving scenarios. Under these real-world conditions, engineers appraised lyrics' drive quality, system calibrations, and other elements that directly impact the in-car experience. The 80% drive resulted in performance evaluations by key lyric driver control and sensory elements, including a new interior audio signature developed to foster occupant comfort and confidence. An accelerated launch schedule for Lyric, driven in part by advances in virtual development and the supporting parallel processes, took the team as far away as New Zealand for test drives. Cold weather testing was conducted there in August to take advantage of the Southern Hemisphere's winter, eliminating the need to wait for the season's onset in the Northern Hemisphere. The Ultium platform is the central structure element of Lyric's chassis, delivering a low center of gravity, exceptional chassis stiffness, and nearly 50-50 front-to-rear weight balance. These factors give engineers unprecedented chassis tuning flexibility that ushers in the next chapter of Cadillac's ride and handling philosophy. Technologies such as five-link front and rear suspension and frequency-dependent dampers help optimize Lyric's ride quality and responsiveness. The five-link front suspension allows engineers to tune the suspension bushings independently, enhancing ride quality while improving handling. The frequency-dependent dampers standard on Lyric at launch differentiate between smaller impacts and larger swells on the road surface. This gives drivers more precise control in variable road conditions and provides greater comfort on smoother surfaces. Production for the 2023 Cadillac Lyric begins in spring 2022 at GM's Spring Hill, Tennessee assembly facility, which received a $2 billion investment to support EV production. An additional $2.3 billion is being invested in an all-new battery cell manufacturing plant at Spring Hill. Lyric will be built alongside other Cadillac SUVs as part of the brand strategy to balance electric vehicle and internal combustion vehicles production during the transition to an electric future. Lyric also offers high-speed DC fast charging, up to 190 kilowatts an hour, enabling customers to add up to 76 miles of range in about 10 minutes. When charging at home, Lyric can replenish its battery at the fastest speeds currently allowed by industry standards when equipped with a level 2 19 kilowatt charge module that allows for up to 52 miles of range per charging hour. The reservation bank for the Lyric debut edition is full, but reservations for additional models will begin next summer. With the newly developed all-terrain complete wheels, the Mini Cooper S Countryman All 4 can also make the most of its capabilities off paved roads. With the help of the roof-mounted sleeping space of the five-door all-rounder, the largest model of the British premium brand becomes a hip camper and thus even more versatile. When paved roads come to an abrupt end, 18-inch all-terrain wheels with Grabber AT3 tires now support the vehicle's exceptional off-road capabilities in all weather conditions. And if the particularly spirited engine not only takes you to the end of the road, but also to the end of the day, the roof tent from the Italian specialist manufacturer Auto Home provides a spontaneous overnight accommodation option. The Mini Cooper S Countryman All 4 is characterized by maximum traction and driving stability. The 18 inch alloy wheels with Grabber AT tires underscore the off road characteristics of the addition with an attractive finish featuring high quality clear lacquer. Thanks to the special design and the paint finish with the blue shimmer, the untamed two tone spoke styling of the wheels emphasizes the sporty driving pleasure of the Mini Cooper S Countryman All 4 visually as well. As soon as the Grabber AT3 tires hit loose ground, numerous grip edges interlock with the ground. On the one hand, it transmits the power of the 131 kilowatt, 178 horsepower four-cylinder engine with many twin power turbo technology in all weather conditions, while at the same time ensuring safe driving pleasure off paved roads. The tread pattern, which is open to the side, gives additional traction in muddy and wet conditions thanks to efficient self-cleaning. If you want to take your adventure spirit to even more remote paths, you can carry your mountain bike conveniently from the folding rear bike rack of the Mini Cooper S Countryman All 4 and pedal away. 
The easy attachment and space saving transport make it easy to decide to take additional gear along on discovery tours. For the necessary rest off the track, the Auto Home rooftop tent offers the perfect place to sleep. The black box weighs 58 kilos and measures 210 by 130 centimeters. The tent is easy to erect. Unlock the box at the front and back, and gas pressure springs open the flap. The tent is boarded via an aluminum folding ladder. Mesh pockets hold the nightly and indispensable small items, and LED light provides an illuminating view. All exterior materials of the mobile sleeping space are made of recycled polyester from 2022. The walls of the roof tent are also made of polyester fibers, for the extraction of which PET bottles from the sea were recycled. Thus, each square meter of the fabric contains recycled plastic from five PET bottles, providing sustainable sleeping comfort for spontaneous overnight stays. On the EcoFoam mattress made of ecological polyurethane, exhausted explorers lie comfortably and allergy-free thanks to the neutral and dirt-repellent material properties and can set off to the next adventure in the morning well-rested. Commemorating the 30th model year anniversary of the North American introduction of the Defender, Land Rover announces a limited production Defender 30th Anniversary Edition. This edition pays tribute to the iconic 1993 Land Rover Defender 110's heritage of rugged styling and capability. Limited to just 500 vehicles, this adventure-ready model is available at select Land Rover retailers. Respecting the extraordinary capability Land Rover is known for, the 30th Anniversary Edition is equipped with all-terrain focused accessories similar to those found on the original. Such features include an expedition roof rack, front and rear classic mud flaps, rubber mats and fixed side steps, deployable ladder, wheel arch extensions, and an A-frame. The 2023 Land Rover Defender 30th Anniversary Edition is priced from $75,000. Barring the possibility of a late-season snowstorm, the north rim of Grand Canyon National Park is set to open on May 15th at 6 a.m. Grand Canyon Trail Rides will also commence in their 2022 seasonal operations on that date. Visitor services, including the campground, Grand Canyon Conservancy Bookstore, and the Backcountry Information Office will open at 8 a.m. Information on daily ranger programs will be available at the Roaring Springs Overlook Kiosk through October 15th. Grand Canyon Lodge North Rim operations, including lodging, groceries, retail, food and beverages services, shower and laundry, and the gas station will also open May 15th. The lodge dining room will open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with reservations required for dinner service. The last day of the 2022 season for most commercial services will be October 15th, 2022. On May 15th, Fire Point on the Kebab Plateau will be reopened to the public. Closed due to the Ike's Fire in September 2019, Fire Point is a popular destination for backcountry car camping, sightseeing, photography, and mountain biking. All overnight use in this area requires a backcountry permit. The National Park Service will continue its operations, including the Backcountry Information Office, through October 31st. Once Highway 67 is closed for the season, the North Rim is only accessible to the public via non-motorized travel. Days of silence from a 35-year-old Austrian climber high on Denali has prompted an aerial search of the mountain by rangers at Denali National Park and Preserve. While Matthias Rimmel, a professional mountain guide, was not considered overdue, the search was launched after a friend hadn't heard from his friend since April 30th. At that time, Rimmel indicated he was just below Denali Pass, which is located at 18,000 feet elevation on the west buttress. Rimmel, who set off on his own from the 7,200 feet elevation base camp on April 27th, reported being tired, but he was not in distress. It was unknown whether he intended to climb higher or return to his camp at 14,000 feet. Rimmel came to Denali already acclimated to altitude due to recent climbs. His plan was to climb alpine style or travel fast with relatively light gear and reach the summit in five days. The Austrian, who was carrying 10 days of supplies, was the first registered climber to attempt the 20,310-foot peak this season. He was said to be alone on the upper mountain with all other teams, including the 1st National Park Service Ranger Patrol, 
camped below 14,000 feet. A friend of the climber grew concerned about his condition after several days of silence. Rimmel had been checking in regularly, but that ended on April 30th. His friend contacted park authorities on May 3rd. On May 4th, the National Park Service helicopter pilot and a mountaineering ranger, already intending to shuttle camp gear to the 14,000-foot basin, flew the route to look for signs of Rimmel. Weather prevented a thorough search of the route. Nevertheless, they did see signs of Rimmel. Searchers did observe his tent site at 14,000 feet. However, no signs of recent activity were visible. The helicopter was unable to land due to deteriorating weather and wind. The aerial search continued Thursday, and favorable weather allowed the helicopter to land at the tent site. Rangers confirmed Rimmel had not returned to his camp. Clouds on the upper mountain prevented the aerial search team from flying above 17,000 feet. Temperatures at the upper elevations on Denali have been cold this past week, reaching daytime highs between negative 25 and negative 30 Fahrenheit, as is typically in the early season, the park reported. An estimated five inches of new snow have fallen on the upper mountain since Saturday. Aerial search operations of the upper mountain were to continue as weather conditions allow. Dropping water levels at Lake Mead National Recreation Area in Nevada have revealed a barrel with human remains tied to an apparent murder possibly dating back to the 1970s. We believe this is a homicide as a result of a gunshot wound, said Lieutenant Ray Spencer, who works in the homicide section for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Detectives believe the victim was killed sometime in the mid-70s to early 80s, based on clothing and footwear the victim was found with. Investigators are currently working to identify the victim. The Southwest's longest-running drought has dropped water levels in both Lake Powell upstream and Lake Mead to their lowest levels since the reservoirs first started filling decades ago. National Park Service rangers found the barrel Sunday evening. Anyone with any information about this incident is urged to contact the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department Homicide Section. I'll leave information down below. One adult female and two adult male lions were killed that found their way onto Flathead Lake's Wild Horse Island to protect park visitors and to shield bighorn sheep lacking escape on the nearly 3.4 square mile island. The three mountain lions hunted down the island's prized Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep herd to as few as 35. About 130 sheep were tallied on the island state park in 2019, with a couple dozen later removed by the department to help reestablish a herd in southwestern Montana. Wildlife officials believe the three cougars, known as cunning, elusive creatures, either swam to the island or more likely accessed its shores in recent winters atop ice. In 2019, Flathead Lake nearly froze over for the first time since the early 1990s. Though lake water surrounding the island could have frozen more recently for the cats to gain access. Sheep might now have to be moved to the island that has served as a prime source for nearly 600 disease-free bighorns to Montana, Washington, and Oregon over the last century. An on-the-ground count estimates that 35 sheep remain on the island. Wildlife officials plan to conduct a flight survey this spring to assess the cougar's damage to the prized sheep herd. Wild Horse Island lies just off the western shore of Flathead Lake within the Flathead Indian Reservation. Wild Horse Island has produced some of the largest rams in the world, according to the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. DNA evidence now shows that the 500-pound black bear the public has nicknamed Hank the Tank is in fact at least three huge bears who have damaged more than 30 properties around Lake Tahoe. The State Department of Fish and Wildlife recently said it will soon begin trapping bears in the South Lake Tahoe area to tag the animals and collect evidence for genetic analysis. The bear will be re-released in a sustainable habitat, and the agency said no trapped animals will be euthanized as part of the project. The bears are responsible for more than 150 incident reports in the region straddling Northern California and Nevada, including a break-in at a residence in the Tahoe Keys neighborhood. One of the Hanks smashed a window and squeezed into the house on Catalina Drive while the residents were at home. Police responded and banged on the outside of the house until Hank exited out the back door and disappeared into the woods. Also known as Jake or Yogi or simply Big Guy, 
The then solo bear was what one wildlife official described as a severely food-habituated bear that has lost all fear of people and thinks of them as a food source. Peter Tira, a spokesman for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, stated, What's problematic about this bear is how large it is. It's learned to use that size and strength to break into a number of occupied residents bursting through the garage door or front door. For the 11th year in a row, Minnesota's moose population remains relatively stable. The 2022 population survey estimates the moose population at 4,700, statistically unchanged from the last survey, which was conducted in 2020. Although there is no statistically significant change in the estimated population relative to 2020, this year's estimated number of moose is the highest since 2011, when the population was midway through a steep decline. Additionally, calves compromised an estimated 19% of the population, and the estimated calf-cow ratio was 45 calves per 100 cows. Both factors are indicators of potential improvement in reproductive success, which has a positive impact on population numbers. While the continued population stability and indicators of reproductive success are good news, Department of Natural Resource researchers point out that Minnesota moose remain at risk long term. Presently, the moose population is 47% lower than its peak in 2006. Now it's time for Random Lists. Random Lists is all about lists Waypoint Overland has created on an array of topics, such as top five national parks, top 10 trails in the United States, top 10 fill in the blank. I think you get it. Some lists will be pure fun and others very informational but they all will have a connection to overlanding in some way. We're very interested in hearing your suggestions for upcoming lists in the comments. Now, here's our random list. This week on Random List, I give my top festivals and state fairs you should add to your overland plans. State fairs and festivals mean fried everything, head spinning rides, cotton candy, parades, beauty pageants, live entertainment, and all types of unique things. If during your journey, you happen to be near one of these events, I highly recommend attending. We're gonna break it down to five fairs and five festivals. Let's get started with fairs. At number five, I have the Freiburg Fair, which is October 2nd to 9th. The biggest state fair in Maine is also the Blue Ribbon Classic Agricultural Fair dating back to 1851. It's known as one of the best agricultural fairs in the United States. This main fair boasts the largest steer and oxen show in the world. It also has wreath-making demonstrations and a popular skillet throw in which women throw cast iron pans as far as they can. There are many, many camping options in the region, and because of its location, I think it would work well with any New England adventure you have planned. At number four, I have the OC Fair, July 15th to August 14th. If your journey takes you to the West Coast, I highly recommend the OC Fair. This Costa Mesa Fair lasts for 23 days and includes a junior livestock auction, courtyard wine seminars, carnival rides, and a whole lot more. Past attendees, including me, rave about the chocolate-covered bacon, the deep-fried butter, and fried zucchini. At number three, I have the Eastern State Exposition, known as New England's Great State Fair. Its location has a lot to do with making this list. Two beautiful rivers border the fair, and this part of Massachusetts is green and beautiful this time of year. Some of the highlights include its wine cheese barn and celebrative avenue of states, the Big E. Also has a signature dessert, the Big E Cream Puff. At number two, I have Alaska State Fair in Palmer, Alaska, August 27th to September 7th. Disclaimer, I've never attended this one, but it's in Alaska, so how could it be a terrible state fair? This year, I do have it on my itinerary for a 45-day trip I'm taking there. Since 1936, Alaska State Fair has featured record-setting giant vegetables, beautiful flower gardens, concerts, plus Alaska Native culture. I can't wait to experience it for myself. At number one, I have Minnesota State Fair, August 25th to Labor Day, September 5th, 2022. 
This was a real easy pick. It's the largest state fair in the country by daily attendance. Minnesota boasts the second largest state fair in the United States, with nearly 2 million people in attendance each year. They have a huge variety of animals on site, even llamas and alpacas. It covers a sprawling 320 acres and delights its visitors with eclectic new foods you've never heard of, as well as classic treats and informative experiences like the Miracle of Life Barn. Now, let's take a look at the festivals on this list. At number five, I have the Cayenne Frontier Days in Cayenne, Wyoming. Going to this event has set the bar pretty high for my expectations of what a rodeo is. It's not just the rodeo itself, but everything surrounding the event and the city of Cayenne. Cayenne Frontier Days is an outdoor rodeo and western type of celebration, which is held annually. This is one of the largest events of its kind, and it attracts about 200,000 people each year. It's started by the annual walking of the streets, which is done the Sunday before the actual event. What attracts more attention is the running of the bulls, which is quite similar to the one that's done in Spain. There are various nightly concerts and different comedy acts. It's basically a fair with rides, games, and multiple food vendors. And a special part of the event is the free pancake breakfast. Its proximity to North Colorado and Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park makes it perfect for an extended journey. And if the national parks aren't your thing, there's lots of national forest everywhere. At number four, I have Coachella Valley Music and Art Festival, April 15th to April 24th. If you can, I highly recommend staying for this entire event. You can lounge around and camp or enjoy one of, one of some of the many concerts and the variety of arts that they have on display. This is an event that's very conducive to overland travel, being able to camp right there and even better if you go with a crew. Afterwards, I recommend visiting, or better yet, camping in Joshua Tree National Park. At number three, I have Burning Man Festival, August 28th to September 5th. Burning Man almost feels like it was created with overlanders specifically in mind. Burning Man is an event focused on community art, self-expression, and self-reliance held annually at the Black Rock City in northwestern Nevada, which is a temporary city, erected in the Black Rock Desert about 100 miles northeast of Reno. The name of the event comes from its culminating ceremony, the symbolic burning of a large wooden effigy referred to as the man. The event is guided by 10 principles, some of which are self-reliance, self-expression, communal effort, civic responsibility, and leaving no trace. Make it to this event at least once. Camp and enjoy the complete experience. At number two, I have the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta, October 1st to the 9th. I've recommended this to everyone who will listen so many times. I'm always giving this one as a recommendation. The Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta is a yearly hot air balloon festival that takes place in Albuquerque, New Mexico during early October. The Balloon Fiesta is a nine-day event occurring in the first full week of October and has over 500 hot air balloons each year. The event is the largest balloon festival in the world, and it's a spectacular thing to see. It's easily a bucket list event in itself, and it's even better as a larger journey. At number one, I have the Maine Lobster Festival, August 3rd to August 7th. This is one of my favorite festivals to attend in the entire United States. It's a big festival, and it's a little festival at the same time. The Maine Lobster Festival is five days of fun and feasting on the fabulous coast of Maine. This annual seafood festival takes place during the first weekend of August from Wednesday through Sunday. What started as an idea for a local marine festival to revive mid-coast Maine communities has turned into an internationally recognized celebration of local seafood. The Maine Lobster Festival attracts visitors from countries around the globe. Well, that's my list. Do you agree or disagree? Do you have your own list? Well, share in the comments. Now it's time for Waypoints. 
Waypoints. Waypoints will cover all aspects of navigation for the overland traveler. Navigation is the act or practicing of navigating. The method of determining position, course, and distance traveled. This week on Waypoints, I respond to a viewer and friend of the podcast who said this after viewing last week's podcast. Hey, Phil, idea for a future video. Show how to set up the Garmin inReach to do automatic updates to your loved ones. Keep up the great videos. Hope you have a good trip to Overland West. First, thanks for the question, and here's your video. All right, so the first thing that we want to do is go to explore.garmin.com, which is the normal place you would probably go in to sign into your account. You, you uh, So sign into your account. And once you've signed into your account, you want to go to social. And social is the area where you are able to control who is able to view your map and know where you are. So the first thing, I believe it's by default shut off, but the first one is map share. So if it's off, you want to turn it on. And by turning that on, it, it activates the map and makes it capable of being available to others to view. And you're able to control it further by going into map share. And here is where you decide who will share, you'll share your map with. Um, and everything is customizable. You can change your name to something recognizable to the person or something more personable. Uh, and then it comes with a message already input, but you can go in and customize your message. But make sure that you leave the, the password, if you're using one, in the message. And I do recommend you having a password uh, so that you can control uh, people knowing where you are because it's a security thing. Next, you have the option to create whatever password that you have. Now, that's populated in the beginning with some abstract password that they give you. So if you don't like that password, if it's not easy to remember or it's not relevant to the person you're sending it to, you're able to send a, a particular password for that person. Now, after we figured out whatever our password is going to be, we go down to these last three sections, which are probably the most important decisions to be made. So let's go right into that. The first one is allow map viewers to send you messages. And just a note, these messages will use your monthly allotment. So whatever particular plan you have, uh, you need to know how many messages you are allotted each month because that's pertinent to you deciding whether you want to click this. So I always click this because it's important to me. The next one is allow map viewers to locate you. And if you click this button, what happens is you no longer have the ability to just send a message to a person and they know where you are when you sent that message. Now, whenever that person wants, they can go onto, a, onto the map share map on their own, sign in, use their password, and know where you are at any time 24-7. Uh, as long as you have your Garmin satellite on and it can reach, make a signal to a satellite, you will be visible to whoever you've given that permission to. So that might be a very important thing to you also. And just a note, you have a universal control over that too. You can just click map share off if you decided you want no one to know uh where you're going or where you're headed. And this is not necessarily some uh, deceitful thing you're doing. It may simply be, uh, let's say you're in Colorado and you're headed to a secret campsite that you love to go to. Well, you don't even want anyone to know what national forest you're in or, you know, what BLM land you're in because then the person can pretty much figure it out. They can, they're like, oh, he's in that forest, he's by that river, so, and they can figure it out. So uh, that's a big decision to make, whether or not you're going to allow a person that freedom of at a click of a button, they can always see where you are. And then again, I have that clicked for me because I want my wife and my daughter to be able to find me at any time, have nothing to hide, I'm not worried about it. 
uh, I just make sure that that's not allowed for anyone else because I value my uh, campsite locations across the country very much. And I don't want to just disseminate that info to anybody. The last one is show waypoints created in the field on MapShare. And I leave this one off because, like I was just saying, uh, there's a lot of valuable information that po possibly you are giving other people, not just as far as your security, but giving away places that you like to go, routes you like to go. So me personally, I don't like to do this. But if let's say you're on a trip and you're on social media and people are following you and you do want them to know the campsites or the uh, special historical sites that you have found or a secret waterfall, then you'd click show waypoints created in the field on MapShare and that would allow them to see those places. And if you've notated anything special about those places, that'll be available to them too. So for me, I leave that. And then you click save. So the next thing is I've got all of this stuff set up. Well, before we go there, let's go, let's cover this. Uh, filter map share data. And this one is uh, it allows you to t control your data as far as uh, how it's saved and how much of it's saved. The first option is you can go in and pick a date and from there and hit clear and it'll clear the data if you want to clear up the data, depending up upon how much you travel. Uh, this is an option that might be necessary. You, you, you have so many waypoints, so many routes, so many different things that you've saved and you want to get rid of some of them. So that, that, that can be a very helpful thing. The next thing is on your map share, whether or not you want other people to be able to see these things, uh, you are able to control what they have available to them, whether it's uh, legacy information from your map or from your actual in-reach device. Um, there may be a difference between the two. And what your library, things that you've saved or archived. And once you've done that, you click save. The next thing is we go over to share. This is where we make a decision on who we're sending these uh, options to, passwords to, availability to your map share after you've customized it to them. You go into email and then you put the person's email in. Some of this stuff will be already populated, but you can change it to whatever you want. Um, you leave your message, and then in addition to that, it gives pertinent information already to the person, like uh, the website to your particular map, your pa the password, and how to get there. And there's usually, a, I think there's a link that they can click to go directly to the map. So that's pretty much it. If you want to be able to let your loved ones or people who you, uh, it's important to you, they know who, where you are 24 seven, that's the way to do it. If you just want to be able to send messages periodically to a person and they know where you are when you send that message, you can set it up to do that. And more specifically to the original question that was asked to me, now you, what you would do is, you would go into your actual Garmin device and then you decide how often you want that signal to bump to the satellite and uh, let, let people know where you're going. Uh, I think on the latest Garmin, it can be, it can ping the satellite like every couple of minutes or it can be once a day and anywhere in between. So you decide how often you want it to ping. I have mine set up for every five minutes. So every five minutes, wherever I am, it sends a ping to the satellite and a person knows where I am. I think you have to look at your particular plan and also in, and figure out whether or not it works out for you to, have to as far as the plan that you chose. But the, the more times it pings, the more accurate it, it is. And if you are in some kind of trouble, the closer to your actual location, the person will have an easier time finding you. So the last thing 
that I want to mention is those two little things you see there, Facebook and Twitter. Now, if you're using social media alongside this, let's say you're going on a trip to Alaska. I'm talking about something that I'm going to do. Uh, I can go down here to, the, to Facebook. I can link my Facebook. I can link my Twitter. And then I can go into Facebook and Twitter. And then I can do the same things that I did with the email. Only difference is people who are friends of mine on Facebook or following me on Twitter or whatever, as I go along my trip, they're able to go in and look at my map and get whatever information that I've customized for them to be able to see. Maybe you just want them to see your waypoints. Maybe you want them to see your route. Whatever it is, you customize that and you send it out to Facebook or, or Twitter. Um, right now, I don't have them set up because I don't have a trip where I want to make the mistake of sending it out to the world. And that's that. Well, that wraps up another episode of the podcast. Next week, we'll be in Flagstaff, Arizona, with coverage of Overland Expo West. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And with that, I want everyone to stay safe, tread lightly, and hopefully I'll see you here or on a trail soon. You have been listening to Waypoint Overland's Random Waypoints. Like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more.